Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar series on leading education in the age of disruption, brought to you by the Development Academy of the Philippines in partnership with the Asian Productivity Organization. I am Yami D from the DAP Center for Governance, and I will be your moderator for this webinar series. The webinar series on leading education in the age of disruption aims to discuss the essential features of Education 4.0 and showcase current education governance trends, practices, and research findings that may contribute to the generation of insights and ideas that could be adopted for policy reform and program implementation for the education sector under the new normal. Before we formally start, allow me first to reiterate some reminders and house rules during this webinar series. All sessions in this webinar series are being recorded and broadcasted live via YouTube for documentation purposes. By joining this webinar, you automatically consent to these re recordings. For attendance purposes of our participants, both here at Zoom and, our, and at our YouTube channel, kindly type in your name and agency at the chat box. To minimize background noises and avoid distraction for the duration of the session, we have temporarily disabled the option to unmute yourselves. Should you wish to speak, you may send a chat message and await the acknowledgement of the moderator to allow you to unmute yourself. Questions during the session will be relayed using the chat box. Kindly type in your name and agency along with your question for the open forum. We may request you to speak if clarification or elaboration is necessary. Lastly, presentation materials can be accessed in the webinar series Google Drive using the link flashed in your screen. Our chat monitors will also post this link in the chat box. If you will experience difficulty in reading the presented material, you can download it now. Some emails, however, may require special permission on our part to access the files. Before we proceed with today's session, allow me to walk you through our discussion last Tuesday during the fourth session of this webinar series. Dr. Tai He Choi, Associate Professor of the Education University of Hong Kong, joined us again for her presentation on preparing teachers for the age of disruption or working with third parties. In her introductory slides, Dr. Choi leveled off our understanding on teacher expertise by highlighting the abilities that teachers as prof professionals need to possess, namely knowledge, skills, practice, and ethical judgment. With a changing future, teachers need to be prepared for both the predictable and the unpredictable. Specifically in times of disruption, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, Teacher development programs should build on teachers' capacity, such as in preparing for lessons and in catering for the needs of learners and families. The role of teachers has become more complex. Thus, among other skills to be enhanced, the ability of teachers to collaborate should be strengthened. Dr. Choi cited uh, organizations such as the USAID Save the Children Philippines, and among others, that have been supported, supportive to the education sector in the Philippines. However, in collaborating with third parties, such as these organizations, quality and equity issues may arise. Schools and third parties should therefore effectively coordinate, and government support is still needed to ensure the quality and equity of education provided in the partnership. Dr. Choi suggested that for us to maximize the benefits from these collaborations, it is important that expectations are clearly laid down, there is effective coordination during implementation, and an evaluation and identification of next steps to be conducted. Coping with the COVID-19 pandemic has convinced us that we need to work with multi-parties, which can involve coming to terms to many different strategies, but these will pay off, she said. The key to success to these collaborations, however, according to Dr. Choi from one of her videos, is for us to remember that outsourcing education does not mean outsourcing the responsibility to educate. 
That is, when we are working together with outsiders, we are not giving away our responsibility to others, but the responsibility still lies with us. Many months after the first reported case of local transmission of the COVID-19 virus in the Philippines, our country's economy is gradually getting back on its feet and people are returning back to work in physical offices. However, schools remain closed and remain dependent on alternative modes of learning. Deemed acceptable by our government, along with our continuing efforts to contain the spread of infection. As we transition to remote teaching and learning, we begin to realize that ideas such as artificial intelligence, adaptive media, and virtual reality, aka Education 4.0, or the future of digital learning, carries a tremendous promise. This pandemic also made us start thinking of making changes to the future of education, including in the teaching and the learning experience. In our session this afternoon, we will look into the experience of India as they come into terms into embracing Education 4.0. In addition to this, we will, we will be oriented into the new education policy of the country beginning the year 2020. Our resource speaker is an assistant professor of Christ University in Karnataka, India. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in business management and proceeded to, per to pursue master's degree and doctorate in business administration. He has been engaged by the Asian Productivity Organization for research on Industry 4.0 and related technologies. And as a resource speaker, such as in the International Conference on Public Sector Productivity held at the DAP Conference Center in 2017. And in the Forum of Disruptive, Disruptive Technologies and Technology-Driven Productivity in Indonesia, in 2019. Last year, he delivered a talk on innovating re-education in the age of digital transformation during the Global Human Resource Forum in South Korea. His other research interests aside from Industry 4.0 include Education 4.0, Digital Transformation, Disruptive Technologies, Leadership, and Organizational Culture. To deliver webinar session five on education 4.0 in the Indian context, let us welcome Dr. Avinash Bian. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Yami, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Yami, for the introduction. This is Dr. Ravinash addressing you from India. So today we are going to discuss about Education 4.0 in the Indian context. Many thanks to APO and DAP for coming together and jointly organizing this particular event. And before we start the event for the day, It's my duty and responsibility to extend and say a warm kamusta. Dignitaries from the Asian Productivity Organization Japan, all the eminent personality from the Development Academy of the Philippines, and the representatives of different departments, verticals, agencies, and all my dearest participants. As you all are aware that we should be always ready to learn new things. And I have tried to say a few things in Filipino language. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's my duty to tell you all this before I start that Inasa Han Kong Likta Skayat Mayoska Maligayang Pagde Tingsa Inayong Lahata. So hope you're all safe and fine during the pandemic and welcome you all to this event. So before we start or proceed with today's session, as all of you are aware that education is an important element of any particular country or an economy. It has got a significant growth on any country's economic development. Now, how do we define an education is always a very challenging task. People define education in different ways. 
education is defined based on the context but if we have to see in a nutshell in short what do we exactly mean by education albert einstein rightly said education is not the learning of the facts but it is the training of mind to think so we need to train the minds to think that is the value of education but thinking what does it lead to it leads to generation of ideas so when we have an idea no one can stop that when the time has come now the time has come for us to change we have a lot of ideas so we can say that no one can stop an idea whose time has come so linking this to the education going forward we are going to discuss about the education 4.0 how are we going to define it and subsequently how the education 4.0 and the future of education is designed from the indian context and how is it that we are planning to deliver so that it percolates to the ground level so before i move to my next slide i would like to appreciate and accept the fact that philippines is a wonderful country i visited philippines in 2017 when i was a speaker in one of the conference for international conference on public sector productivity which was held at tagatay city i have traveled different countries across the world but the best thing about philippines is they extend a great level of hospitality i'm sure and i will definitely acknowledge the fact that the kind of hospitality the filipinos extend i have never experienced this in any parts of the world that i have traveled so far so thank you very much and before we start i would like to appreciate each one of you because this is a service sector that we are going to talk about this requires a high levels of gratitude servant leadership and hospitality attitude when we deliver the education which is a very important element for the future growth now to begin with i'm sure most of you are from the reputed universities the education department and the representatives managing the bigger challenges for the future so if we have to see in a nutshell what exactly education is all about it is nothing but a tool that is going to provide us the knowledge and it provides us the knowledge of the world which is around us it teaches about nature it teaches us about the society it teaches about the whole universe and it is going to develop a perspective amongst us to see the life how it was how it is and how it is ought to be it helps in gaining several skills and techniques and to understand or know the information so that we can discharge our duties towards our family towards the society and towards the nation and it helps us to believe the opinions towards the different things in our lives it helps us to give the ability to judge and interpret what is right what is wrong what is good and what is bad and what has to be chosen at what particular point of time so this is where we see the simple definitions of education come into picture but we also see that education is considered as one of the very important sustainable development goals so we see unesco among the 17 sustainable goals that they have defined have said that education is a human right and a force for sustainable development as well as peace among the 17 sustainable goals which was proposed by unesco the fourth one what we see is the quality education today it is not just that education is what is required for us it is the quality of education that we really need to deliver now the question comes is there a difference between education quality of education education 4.0 yes we have to draw a line going forward as to how the education needs to be defined designed and delivered because as yami was mentioning a few minutes ago the previous speaker was telling that 
we are all living in an economy which is unpredictable and which is uncertain. So all I have to tell is we are all living in the future which is called as VUCA. That is V-U-C-A. So we are expecting high levels of volatility in the countries today. The businesses are very volatile. The stock market is volatile. And we see that the market is changing very fast. The technology is very volatile. And the next thing is uncertainty. We do not know what happens next. I'm sure six months before, many of us never imagined that we are all going to adopt to digital transformation very fast. In fact, we are adopting it without a choice five years ahead of time. So we never expected and things changed. Children started learning from home. People started working from home and most of the things went online and the markets became unpredictable. Many people lost their jobs. Many things changed over a period of time. And we live in an age of complexity. Things are becoming more and more complex. It may be because of the competition. It may be because of information overload. It may be because of lack of awareness. It may be because of lack of understanding and inability to interpret things. So we are all living in the world of complexity again. And also um, ambiguity. We do not know what things exactly are or the way I understand it is not exactly the way it is. So we all live in the world of VUCA. I repeat, that is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, in addition, we see that today, because of rapid economic and social changes that are taking place, economies are changing drastically in a bigger landscape. And there is a social change. People are changing. The society is changing. It is improving. It is becoming better. But at the same time, several challenges are also coming as part of the society. But now, if we have to address a larger picture, who has to really address? It is we, the citizens, who have to address the larger socio-economic changes. But now, if we have to address, do we have all this knowledge by ourselves? No, we need to learn. As elders, as adults, we always have the privilege and ability to learn. But what about the next generation? So we have to prepare the children of our schools for the future. And what is that for which we have to prepare them? We have to prepare them for the jobs that have not been created yet. I do not know what kind of jobs may be there after 10 years. So I have to create children today in such a way that they are prepared for the jobs which does not exist today, but which will be existing after 10 years. And technologies that not have been invented. What technology I used five years ago, I'm not using it anymore. Or probably what technology we are using today, we may not use it anymore in the near future. So we do not know what kind of technology we will be addressing in the future. And the problems that we don't yet know will arise. So what kind of problems may arise in the near future? We may have emotional challenges. We may have attitude challenges. We may have health challenges. We may have society challenges. So what kind of challenges may come in the near future is something that is still unpredictable. That is why we live in the world of UCA. So the biggest onus on our shoulder is how do we prepare our students for the future, which is so unpredictable? Now the question comes, can I try to create a better future by doing what I am currently practicing. So what we see is there is a need for bringing change in education. As John Davy rightly said, if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. So what exactly that we mean is we cannot expect to get different results by doing the same things. So we have to do things differently. So we have to make sure we deliver an education that is required for future, that is required for tomorrow. So when we say, what is that education that is required for tomorrow? It is nothing but the education 4.0. So now the need of the hour is education 4.0. Now in education 4.0, I'm sure from the previous webinar series, you might have heard quite important information or learned few important things which talks about bringing 
the digital technology into the curriculum and learning and the innovative pedagogies which are incorporated for learning and how do we bring in a learning ecosystem which is going to be important now the question is if i have to embrace education 4.0 now how did this education 4.0 come into picture i could have simply called it as education why is it that we are calling it as education 4.0 now the reason why education 4.0 came into existence was because of the fourth industrial revolution so education 4.0 was triggered by fourth industrial revolution what we commonly refer it to as industry 4.0 so the industry 4.0 has changed the landscape of the economies today if you can observe how the world economic forum is looking into it and what the fourth industrial revolution is going to do which has been published in the international newspapers and the impact of digital revolution that can actually takes place has all impacted in education so the root cause that gave rise to education 4.0 was industry 4.0 so before we progress or proceed about understanding what exactly the education 4.0 let us try to see and get an understanding about what exactly the industry 4.0 which gave birth to education 4.0 so when we look at industry 4.0 how did it evolve it did not come on one single day it evolved over a period of time but of late it is evolving faster so you can see 20 million years ago the first kind of mankind how they were and how did they evolved over a period of time it took millions of years for human beings to evolve to what we are today but if we see how the industry 4.0 evolved over a period of time during 1970 uh, sorry that is sorry that is during 1784 or 1700s closely to 1800s we see that the industry 1.0 came into existence that is where the water steam and mechanical production was used and in 1870s so almost close to around 90 years of first industrial revolution we started experiencing second industrial revolution that we refer to industry 2.0 where electricity came into picture and mass production started with the new advancement in innovations and technologies in 1969 we started experiencing the growth in electronics the information technology field and the automation what we refer to industry 3.0 but from 2011 onwards we started experiencing and practicing industry 4.0 which talks about bringing in robotics internet of things artificial intelligence big data analytics in the industries now the question is when industry continued to grow over a period of time on different versions do you think we can expect to remain in the same education version that we are actually living today so what did this industry 4.0 actually do so industry 4.0 is characterized by digitization of economic and production flows so we try to bring in the complete digital transformation we digitize we put all the data that is there in the physical format to the soft copy format from all the books i move to computers in such a way that it is available anywhere at any given point of time i am digitizing my business and i am digitalizing my business when i say digitalize i am bringing in the best of the technologies and i am undergoing digital transformation means we are implementing digital aspects to every elements of business so there is an end to end implementation of digitalization for the entire ecosystem that is where we are undergoing digital transformation in order to address industry 4.0 so industry 4.0 is itself characterized by digitization of economic and production flow so it focus on interconnectivity i'm sure all of you have heard about internet of things which connects everything people and people are connected people and objects are connected objects and objects are connected objects and machineries are connected and machineries and people are connected there is an interconnectivity and there is automation and we, today we talk about the real time data and machines interact with one another people interact with one another and processes interact with one another and it is revolutionizing the way the entire business operates and grow this is how the industry 4.0 is progressing countries like germany 
South Korea, Singapore, for all the pioneers in this particular area are really setting us new goals for us to industrially evolve and to embrace Industry 4.0. Now the question comes here, if industry is growing like that, should the education also grow? Yes. Industry 4.0 has impacted education critically. Education 4.0 has impacted industry the other way around. There is a link between both. The way industry grows, it is leading to the growth of education. And the more the education growth, it is leading to the growth of industry. So now, the impact of industry 4.0 on education, what kind of impacts we are seeing today? There is a technology driven expectations. You can see from the slides that though the students are sitting in the library where there are a lot of books, still there are computers. So we are seeing that technology driven expectation is looking ahead in digitizing and digitalizing the things. And the education is getting more and more personal. Need not be that all of us have to study the same thing. I can study what is of my interest. I can learn what probably I'm actually good at. And artificial intelligence is being introduced. The technology is being and becoming an integral part of education today. And the next is the IoT is taking over where we see that all the devices are interconnected to each other. So there is a significant impact of industry 4.0 on education. And at the same time, there is an impact of education 4.0 on industry 4.0. So the education is evolving in response to the changes in the society. As I mentioned earlier, we cannot continue to do the same thing and expect different results. Education is making people to think, think for better. And for tomorrow, we have to redefine the way we are delivering the things. The changes that are in turn driven by evolving education system. And education 4.0 is a new experience based education system that uses the digital technologies. It may be personally we are using the digital technologies. We may be using for collaborative learning. We may use it for connecting and we may use it in classrooms or we may use it everywhere. And it responds to the needs of the new world through personalized education. I can learn whatever I want and brings together technology, individuality and discovery based learning. People want to discover things on their own. It is no more that they are confined to only one class or only one book. We can discover the whole universe today. That is where the need for education in Industry 4.0 comes. Now, when we are talking about Industry 4.0, let us look into how the Industry 4.0 evolved over a period of time. I'm sure there are many teachers here, many of you from the Department of the Education who will accept the fact that Education also evolved over a period of time. So when we look at education 1.0, it was more of authoritarian. The teacher was the more autocratic kind of a person. And whatever the teacher says, the students had to learn. Students were just receptive about the knowledge what was delivered by the teacher. There was hardly any questioning that happened from the students or by the students. Whatever the teacher said, that is final and that is right. There was no element of critical reasoning and questioning. The students were hardly participative. They were just a passive recipient. And it was more a teacher-centered system because the entire class was controlled by the teacher. And the duty of the teacher was just to give knowledge to students. And they were just acting like the leaders of the class. Students should just listen to what we say. And of course, there was hardly anything called as technology which was used. Traditionally, the blackboards or the green boards were used. The teacher used to write. The teacher used to teach from the book and the children used to learn. And that is where the education 1.0 came into picture. So it was more of the teacher centric and the students were passive. They were just listening to what 
the teacher was talking about. This is how the education 1.0 was there. Probably my grandparents told me about education 1.0. This is how their things were when they were studying. Then came education 2.0. So in the 2.0, we saw that there was some changes in the way the education took place. There was change in the way the knowledge was delivered. So the communication and collaboration started to grow. Where children used to be just passive receivers, they started interacting with one another. They started communicating with one another. Teachers started communicating with children. Children started communicating with one another. And where it was ideally an autocratic center in education 2.0, we started seeing that collaboration started picking up. The concept of teamwork started growing. Children could gel with one another. They could learn not only from their teacher, they could also learn from their own friends. And there was exam-based approach. And the results of the examinations came based on how the children used to memorize the knowledge. So again, here we see that the knowledge was more about memorizing what we call rote learning. You learn something, by heart something, put whatever is there in the textbooks, put it to your mind, go to an exam, just write that, you get the marks and you get more marks and you are an intelligent person. And it was underestimated student-centric approach. We call it, but do not apply it. So though the students were collaborating and communicating with one another, still it was not student-centered it was still at the hands of a particular faculty member or a teacher. So some people think they stopped talking about teaching and they're talking about the learning and learning outcomes, but they were still on the paper. People started talking about these concepts about collaboration and communication, but to what extent it was practiced was a big question. Because the practices of education 1.0 did not change in a big way when it came to education 4.0. They were all just on the pen and papers. The schools are still talking about the number of hours of teaching, but we never try to quantify what was the amount of learning that went into the children. So we say six hours, children should go to the school or eight hours, they should go to the school. These are the number of subjects they will be learning. This is the timetable. Each and every hour, a new teacher will come. They will talk about the subjects. We have to complete the syllabus. And we talk about number of hours we talk, you know, we deliver the teaching. But what about the learning? That was, again, a big question. Then came the education 3.0. So slowly, it started moving towards being student-centered. So students used to communicate with one another. They used to connect with one another. Internet started coming into the picture. And different methodologies were brought into teaching. And it became more of a student-centered approach where the teacher is transformed into a coordinator facilitator, advisor, learner, and practice guide. So the teacher was not just a teacher. The teacher also started becoming a mentor. They started understanding each and every student. They used to coordinate each and every activities which were related to the students. They started becoming advisors. They started becoming mentors. So the students were more brought towards researching. They started telling that not just learning in the classroom is important, you should research. Say, for example, I have a plant sapling. So now I can say that this is a plant which I put it somewhere, it grows as a big tree. But the student should start understanding and realizing which tree has to be planted where. If there is a region which is very hot, in the summer and that particular region needs a lot of shade or if i'm growing certain crops it requires a shade what kind of plant saplings you need to plant so that it turns to be a tree and it can be adding value there so it's not not just about learning a plant where we should put which particular plant was a question that is where the researching started increasing among the student means the inquisitiveness towards questioning and logical reasoning started coming into picture and students started researching what why when where how these kind of things and flipped classroom methodology started coming in. The blended teaching, bringing in the textbooks, bringing in the collaborative learning, bringing in the technology, bringing in the concept of teamwork started coming into the classrooms. So more dialogue started. Technology was in place. And students started learning by self. 
and they could learn from anywhere and everywhere. So with the advent of Education 3.0, the typical or the traditional classroom kind of a style of teaching or education does not exist anymore. But however, let me tell you this, we are talking from Education 4.0 perspective, but if we go to rural classes, we have a lot of villages, we have small towns and cities, we have the remote schools, the public schools, still we see that the concept of education 1.0 exists, 2.0 exists, and 3.0 exists. So we are all here to see that how we can transform together and move towards education 4.0. But in 3.0, the other things are lesson plans are now called as learning plans. That is where we have the subject, we have the units, or we have the syllabus, and we are talking about learning and calling it as LOs, what we call as the learning outcomes. If I study a course, if I study a subject, if I study a topic, what are the learning outcomes that are expected out of? So all this started coming in Education 3.0. So if I have to talk in Indian context, we still have Education 1.0, we have 2.0, we have 3.0, but we have decided and we have designed that we have to move to Education 4.0 and we have to implement it. And I'll be talking about this going forward. And then later came is the Education 4.0. So what happens in Education 4.0? That is the co-creation and innovation is in the center. So who creates syllabus? Who brings in new education? It's everyone. The teachers come in, the government come in, the children themselves come in, the industry people come in, the think tanks come in, the subject matter experts, the parents, the guide, and somebody like APO and DAP comes in, and we all are going to co-create what is required for the future. And we see that innovation is at the center. So innovating things are very important. Not just we deliver education, we deliver it in innovative way, which can trigger the thought process and not just reading the books is of prime importance. Understanding and developing the learning from that takes a front role. And whenever and wherever, I'm sure most of your kids today might have just finished their classes in the morning. And after they have finished their classes, I'm sure you might have taken over the laptops or the mobile phones from there. So your children started learning sitting at the house, so wherever. And they can see the videos that are shared by the schools sitting late evening sometime at the free time. So whenever they want to see the videos, they started doing that. The way the recording is happening of this session, it can be seen at any given point of time. And we see flipped classrooms started coming into picture where teacher is not just teaching, they are involving the students. They are going for breakout sessions. Teacher is discussing about an article. Teacher is giving a case study to study. And there is a face-to-face -face learning. And there is also online learning, collaborative learning, and breakout learning. So we see that the concept of flipped classroom come into picture. We may use the Zoom. We may use the Google Meet. We may use WebEx. And we use the learning management systems. Several massive open online courses are there. Google Classrooms have come. So we have brought in technology into practice. And there is more interactive, practical exercises that are happening. One is face-to-face -face and the other is online. So due to pandemic, we may be away from face-to-face -face teaching as of now, but going forward, we are all going to experience those things again. And learning can be done at home. It can be done at schools and wherever it is required. And we can develop the skills. A child need not have to develop the skills only related to the subject they study. Today they can see the arts, they can learn how to draw, they can design the crafts, they can learn how to sing, they can learn how to dance, they can pursue their several interests. And this is where the development of personalized teaching and learning came into picture. I can join multiple sessions, I can join multiple agencies where they teach me different things, I can start pursuing my interest. Means whatever potential lies in a child is trying to be harnessed to the maximum benefit. And learning plans are now called as creativity plans. And the technology is being used in a bigger way. It is free or easily accessible today. Of course, we may have to pay the fees to universities or the colleges, but internet has brought in several things which is free. So we need to choose what is that we need to really perceive and what we exactly want. And there is an increased use of virtual reality. We don't have to be physical in the place. 
the growth of virtual reality due to advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and there is a continuous innovation and evolution, and therefore the need for continuous training and development of the new knowledge and skills by all is required. I definitely heard uh, this. Uh, I remember that I had heard this some time back. A man dies twice in his life. So this was a very strange statement for me. A man dies twice in his life. So one thing we all know is once our age is over, we all die. Nothing is eternal in this world. That is once. But when was it second time we die? That was very interesting for me to understand. The day we stop learning, the day we stop acquiring new skills, the day we stop adopting to the changes, the day we stop being more responsive to the things that are taking place or changes that are happening in the outside world, we die. So change is inevitable for us. So we have to adopt to change. We have to embrace change. Changes has not only happened in the field of education where the way education is delivered, changes also has taken place in the classrooms also. So we see the evolution of classrooms. The first picture shows from 1919 how things have changed in 2019. From being a traditional classrooms where we carry the books every day to schools or colleges, we have started coming to a classroom where we have a whiteboard, we have a green board, where we have monitors, students come with books, students come with laptops and other gadgets. So we also see in another diagram that from a traditional classroom, we have moved to a classroom where the classroom is completely digitized and the teacher is going to deliver a digital experience learning and there are tabs or systems in front of you and you can go for exploring the things and applicability of whatever the body of knowledge that has been delivered there. So we see that not only the way education is being delivered, the classrooms are also changing over a period of time. The entire ecosystem is changing. So what are the elements of the learning ecosystem which are in response to the industry 4.0? So there is a learning ecosystem. On the one side, it provides optimized learning systems. We have to remember one thing. Today, we are all facing a problem. The problem of plenty. We have too much of everything today. And internet offers that. And that too much is also available at free of cost. So we need to understand what is important for us. We need to prioritize how we need to make use of the available system. That is where the learning system comes into picture and it focuses on each learner. So what are the various materials I used for learning? Whether I go for only reading, whether I go for doing the art and crafts, that is a physical exercise, or I try to do it something in the real time, or I see just a video and I try to understand something. We have different materials for learning and everything is personalized. Each person can learn actually the way they want it. I may prefer to read a book and learn. You may want to watch a video and learn. Somebody may want to actually do, practice and then learn. And there is a convergence in the way we learn actually. And most of the things we see in the schools, they are all performance-based assessments. So we perform and they get. And the performance is no more related just to examinations. We are following something called as formative assessments. Like we are going to assess children in different ways and we are going to assess them consistently, not just at the end of a particular year. And recommending the best way of learning for different individuals. And teacher role will be diversified teachers will not just have the role of just teaching they will have many other roles to play that i'll be discussing in the next few slides and experience specialized digital learning outside the schools right no more confined to only the classroom you can see your children how they are really learning today and adopting to the changes and they are very fast honestly speaking the way we adopt to technology children can adopt much faster and they're more excited to make use of the technology and there is a way we learn the things and there is a process and the learning environment is restructured into learner centered activities everything is learner centered today and learning transcends the time and space and there is a customized curriculum that consider individual learning processes each and every person can have a curriculum which has been customized the way we are assessed I may go for a descriptive examination. I may go for an objective type examination. I may go for a case study oriented examination. So we see that there are several elements which have actually come 
and made learning ecosystem to be more vibrant, to be more agile in response to the changes that are taking place in industry 4.0. So now we have to see how the education is going to be in the 21st century. So now can I request uh, the DAP to play this particular video? We'll just quickly have a look at the video which talks about education in the 21st century, which is more focused on student-centered learning. I'll stop sharing my session, and after you present the video, I will get back to the sharing. Yami and team, can I have you uh, please playing the video one? A chalkboard. A desk, the homework, the books. The day begins and ends when the bells ring. For centuries now, this has defined what all of us think about school. We have come to believe that this is the one way that students will learn. And with that belief, we have taught all of our students in pretty much the exact same way. But the world has changed, and what it means to be ready to succeed in the future has also changed. That means our model of learning must change. It's happening now, and it needs to happen even more. In more places, for all students, especially for those for whom the current system isn't working. There is strong data that shows we need to rethink learning. Like remodeling a house, we're not just adding a new coat of paint, we're updating the outdated parts and making it more modern and efficient, strengthening what works and fixing what doesn't. Gone are the days when some students can excel and others just get by. Our society needs all kids to excel at high levels. And to make this happen, we need to engage our students like never before. This is student-centered learning. It incorporates a student's skills and interests into the learning process, making the experience more personalized and involving the student in his or her own future. What makes this work? There are four key principles of student-centered learning. Number one, learning is personalized. Personalized learning happens when teachers know students, have strong relationships with them, and can meet students where they are in their development. Number two, learning is competency-based. Learning is about the information and skills a student has mastered, not just moving through a curriculum. In a competency-based system, students can proceed at their own pace in every subject, enabling teachers to respond to individual needs, interests, and challenges. Number three, learning happens anytime, anywhere. Students will often make important discoveries about themselves and the world around them when they learn beyond the traditional school day and outside the traditional school walls. Learning doesn't start and stop when the bells ring. And number four, the last key to student-centered learning is students take ownership. Don't make a decision about students without students. They play a direct role in their own success, actively engaging with the process to ensure the impact is lasting and meaningful. For student-centered learning to work, all four of these principles must work together. This is not an a la carte approach. It's reimagining education so it works for all students. The fact is, our world is changing. And with the latest in child development research, we know better than ever before how children and young adults learn. The facts are there, and they point to the need for a new system of learning designed around each student. And when this student becomes stronger and more focused, all of us will benefit from a new generation that is contributing to our communities and our world in so many ways. This is student-centered learning. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, playing the video. Uh, I would like to share my screen back again. So I hope uh, this was an informative video which talks more about the importance of student-centered learning and the relevance behind the same. So Education 4.0, when we are looking into it, 
the learner will always be at the center of the education system irrespective whether it is about the society or the industry or the university where the university may talks about uh, talk about the lecture or the research or the relevant skills or the kind of assessments that they do and the kind of courses that may actually offer or the society which may lead to the peer learning or follow the ethics or imbibe the culture among the people or the industry which may be offering them the real time exposure or it may be on the job learning or off the job learning so comparing all the facts that are existing that what remains more important irrespective of a dynamic technology or an experiential learning is that the learner will always be at the center of the education system the child or the children what we call them to be the learners are going to be the key point of focus here now how will the future learner looks at the learning the learner of the future is more aware about the kind of technology that are existing and the way they want to actually learn and the way they want to actually acquire the knowledge and they have an individual goal they are aware about what they want to learn and how they want to progress but of course what they want to learn how they want to progress and what is that they want to exactly perceive what their aspirations are may not be well understood by themselves it is the duty of the teachers it is the duty of us to nurture the young minds and ignite the thoughts and trigger their thought process and aspire them to become something what they really love to become and over a period of time they start developing their own individual goals and now how is that they start learning what they want in the near future in addition to the classrooms in addition to the teachers they also start making use of the blended learning what kind of delivery methods are important for them to learn better which method will make the learning to be more effective what kind of teaching pedagogy is important do i just simply go and teach about the concepts or do i teach about how we apply these concepts in the real world do i talk about some solutions or do i talk about how each of the solutions can be applied to different problems do we go for an individualized learning or are we go for a collaborative learning this is how the future learner is going to be very much aware about what they actually want and why is it that we need to really need all these things the career growth today we all live in a networked world we are all moving from a platform based economy sorry we are all moving from a linear economy to a platform based economy what happens in a linear economy is we all work in silos we are all living as individuals whereas in a platform based economy we remain as a center of connection rather we create a means of connection so we have to grow in our careers so everybody's growth is a country's growth and when we learn together there is knowledge enhancements that takes place but still we need to con con you know to perceive our personal interest and where is that we are going to learn in the near future it can be from the campus at home in my workplace and even in the industry premises there is no time or place which has been fixed for learning for the future and when can we learn today unlike classrooms where i have a particular academic calendar or a year now we can go with the self paced say i am a professor i still pursue some online courses i may go to udemy i may go to coursera i may try to learn new things i want to enrich my knowledge when do i learn i learn it whenever i want where do i learn probably i learn when i am traveling when i am sitting in the car when somebody else is driving i may learn things or whenever i have free time i can learn and is there an age limit definitely not what i could not learn at the age of 20 probably i am still learning because if i don't learn now there is no point in me trying to learn the same thing at the age of 60 and time duration do i have to sit for 15 minutes i still can do i have to see for 5 minutes i can do i have to sit for 2 hours yes we can and there is a core motivation that is required and it requires certain level of competencies one fine day i can't ask a child a child or a student to come and learn everything online i am sure i'm going to talk about some of the challenges in education 4.0 where many of us from the education department are facing lot of challenges and we are also lacking some of the core competencies that are required because the pandemic which has created and we had to address it so quickly and we all have started learning the life skills that we all started developing the skills to remain safe in pandemic but still started addressing the day to day life activities and we need to develop a job specific skills for the future 
So when the learner of the future talks about, I was reading an article, tomorrow Google or Facebook, whom you call some of the biggest giants in the world in terms of employability, it may be Amazon, what they exactly want is the job specific knowledge. They may not hire me because I'm a doctorate. They may hire a 10 standard student who know to do coding better. Though I am a doctorate, I may not be knowing the coding better. So do you have a specific knowledge or skill to perform a task? You can come and start working with. The traditional jobs will not exist. I'm sure most of you might have heard about something called as gig economy, GIG, gig economy. There may be no permanent jobs for the future. Organizations may ask you to come and work for a certain point of time and you may leave. And if I don't find somebody in Philippines, you may find you may hire somebody from other country and they may teach online. They may come to Philippines for a few months. They may teach and they may go back. And I may not have a permanent job at all. And what skills I have today may not exist for tomorrow at all. So we need to address this. That is where we have to bring up our students or we have to cope up with an education system where we create them for the future, where we do not know how the future turn up to be. We do not know what challenges may come. We do not know what kind of technology may come. That is where again, which can train and think and make people to learn to be adaptable to all the agile trends that are taking place in the society is what the education 4.0 actually talks about. And this is what even the World Economic Forum is also going to be telling us about. The World Economic Forum education framework, what does it say? We have to develop the skills among the children or the students where they tend to become the global citizens. In the near future, I may no more be called as an Indian citizen or I may no more be called as a Philippine citizen. I may be no more called as a South Korean citizen. We are all going to be called as global citizens. Somebody sitting in India may be teaching a school in Philippines. Somebody teaching in Philippines may be training the students in India. Somebody sitting in Philippines and India may be jointly teaching some of the universities in United States. Because we are all going to be global citizens and we are going to talk about the global skills and whatever the global market demands, those skills have to be developed for the future. Because I may not find potential in my own country and I may want my people to find careers outside. And where Children or students or people may not find careers in the other country, may start finding careers in the other countries. And innovation and creativity skills are the important elements and technology skills. And let me tell you why technology skills are very important, especially for the teachers. And interpersonal skills, how we not only communicate with each other and how we also connect with one another. I'm sure I did not get an opportunity to interact with you people one on one unless I may answer some of your queries, which is on the chat box at the end of the session. But I definitely know that in addition to communicating to you people, connecting to you people was very important for me. And that is where I made an attempt. Sorry if I made any mistakes in trying to address you people in the regional language or in the Filipino language during the beginning. And it is going to be more of personalized and self paced learning. I can learn whatever I want at the pace and accessible and inclusive learning and problem-based and collaborative learning. We all learn by problem solving today. That is the case study approach is one of the biggest pedagogy or the most innovative you know, pedagogy people are talking about. And children are being given the problems and asked how to solve. They will come up with their own innovative ideas. And lifelong and student-driven learning. I, te I teach to a set of postgraduate students and one of the student comes and tell me, sir, I finished my postgraduation. That is end of my education career. I'm not going to join any colleges, no more classrooms, no more listening. And I'm just going to work throughout my life. And my answer was, you are having qualification today. But the real life learnings will begin from tomorrow. Because all these days you learned first and then you took the exam. But going forward, when you join a job, when you make your career, first you are going to take the test, which you do not know what the syllabus is, and that will make you to learn. So learning will remain for the lifespan of the organization. And also the education, sorry, the World Economic Forum Education 4.0 Framework has proposed some of the emerging skills for the next decade. So there are some of the skills which were earlier existing, which were of prime importance, which are declining. And we see that for 2022, 
there are new skills which are coming up what are those skills for 2022 maybe for 2025 analytical thinking and innovation we need to think analytically we need to know how to play with numbers we need to how to we need to know how to interpret the data decision should be more of data should be more of data driven and innovation how can we do different things and how we can do the things differently active learning learning also has you know to be active and sometimes we see that when we learn we are not active we just try to take it for granted and what are my learning strategies i don't understand when i read a book i don't understand whenever i listen from somebody but i may see a video and i may understand it much better creativity originality and initiatives and technology design all these things are going to be the most important skills of the future so if we have to precisely list down in an understandable manner in addition to emotional intelligence reasoning leadership and other thing i have listed out some of the critical or the key skills for 21st century so let us see what are the 21st century skills which are actually required i'm sure most of you teachers would acknowledge the fact that these are the ones you may be already practicing in your organizations or you may already be teaching this to your students at your university or at the school levels so developing the leadership that is a prime important element a leader is not a leader until unless he develops the leadership among us and the question is why is that we need to develop leadership among all the students among all the children it is because these are the children who are going to lead our nation in the future developing leadership is a legacy that we leave in leave in them that they will lead the countries the economies and the world towards a better living and towards a better society and the leadership skill among every children everybody has to lead in their own ways they may have to lead in education they may have to lead in culture they may have to lead in arts they may have to lead society they may have to lead in politics they may have to lead in anything that they try to do and collaborate a person cannot perform individually things today we have to collaborate we have to collaborate with the people we have to collaborate with the objects we have to collaborate with machines and we have to collaborate with technology and being more creative the better way of doing things and the next thing is coming with digital literacy when i say digital literacy we have a common understanding that if i just know how to operate my mobile if i know how to operate my laptop then i have digital literacy digital literacy is not just about knowing how to use my electronic gadgets digital literacy talks about one is i should know how to make use of technology and electronic gadgets i should know when to use which technology i should know to what extent i should use technology i should develop human literacy it is not just i am using then the digital literacy is there i should also know whether the other person is using whether the other person can use the technology the way i can use it and we need to be empathetic towards all others using the technology because today digital literacy is not just about one person having a laptop everybody has to have i'm sure all of you are having your mobiles or your laptops or a desktop using which you are seeing the talking today but i should be empathizing as to how others are actually making use of this technology and effective communication emotional intelligence one of the biggest problem the world is facing in terms of crisis people are emotionally down they need emotional intelligence we all have to work or deal with emotions of children or the students or elders or anybody and develop a sense of entrepreneurship now the question is do we develop the students for the future to get jobs or to give the jobs so if we have to develop them to give jobs which can have a big impact on boosting of economy we have to promote entrepreneurship we should develop the risk taking ability among the children so that they will give jobs to others and the more jobs creates is created the economy will tend to grow and develop them towards being a global citizen know that different languages different culture different arts different countries economies different countries markets different products required in each of our different countries problem solving and most importantly the teamwork so these are some of the very important skills of the 21st century of course there are quite a good number of skills or other skills that are there i'm sure you are very much aware of it but however these are some of the very important one to list out
So the future of education, how does the learning and teaching comes into picture if we have to acquire all these skills? What should be the way we learn the things? How should we the teaching be if we have to move forward? So let us take a quick look at the video. I request the DAP to play this video. The video number two. As the world we live in changes to embrace tech futures, how and what we teach in our education system will also be reshaped to keep up to date with the growing demands of the 21st century. Let's take a look at the future of learning and teaching. 1. Connectedness, Collaboration and Co-Creation The concept of a teacher standing in front of a room full of students who listen and respond to direction is increasingly a thing of the past. While not an entirely new approach, student learning spaces will supersede the typical classroom that we know today. This will see students become partners or co-creators of their own learning. Experiences that allow collaboration, communication and teamwork for all students often happen beyond classroom walls. We need to facilitate for these experiences in context, and our classrooms need to be a reflection of this. They will be set up to allow collaboration to occur on learning projects between individuals, small groups or larger groups. Classrooms will coexist as physical spaces and online, flipping the current learning model upside down so that students can learn at home and spend class time collaborating and applying their knowledge to real life issues. 2. Anywhere, Anytime Learning As we ride the wave of the digital era, it is becoming easier to get connected with a global reach. A world of information is at your fingertips with the click of a button or a simple voice command, and, as technology continues to advance, students need to grow their learning with it. Technology is no longer a motivating factor when it comes to learning, it is a must. It's something that needs to be incorporated in the future of education to ensure students are equipped with the skills to cope in a world dependent on technology. While some argue that technology in our classrooms creates lazy, disconnected students, we believe this is a myth. Technology has created endless boundaries of where learning can occur, with whom and why. The reality is, classrooms can be anywhere anytime. Students can be working on projects in virtual contexts with other students from around the world at any given moment. Technological advances have enabled interconnectedness of information and people with the touch of a button. Education in the future will need to demonstrate how technology can be used to students' advantage, as well as teach future generations how to handle problems that arise from it. Technology can change learning forever and we need to embrace it and manipulate it to our advantage. 3. Customization for a learner-first approach Alongside our changing notions of what constitutes a classroom, our ideas about the way teaching is delivered must also be reshaped. Most professions treat each individual's case differently, each patient of a doctor has individualized treatment plans. Education should be no different. The old one model of teaching and learning fits all is outdated and has no place in the agenda for future education. Teachers will become facilitators of learning and students will have more control of their own learning journey. In the past, all children did the same work regardless of ability or skills. We now know that this contributes to disengagement, misbehavior and poor outcomes. As a result, teachers will have individualized learning plans for students, which will enable each student to learn at a pace that best suits their abilities and to engage with content that is most beneficial to them. A combination of evidence gathering and feedback from parents, students and other professions will enable these plans to be successfully integrated into the education system. To maximize the potential for individual progress, some elements of teacher-led learning will remain, which will augment traditional learning practices when combined with online digital media. 4. Putting testing to the test What are we testing for? Students today are heavily focused on the end result, achieving that high ATAR score, receiving a distinction in class, acing those tests. Education of the future will prove what you have been told many times before, results do not define you. We believe that testing on its own can be a dangerous approach. Grading is a waste of time if its purpose is solely to point out who is at the top and who is at the bottom. Assessments in the future will be evidence-based, using measures that allow learning plans to be drawn up and personalized. The big question is why are we grading and for whom? Surely we want a society in which everyone is able to do the job and elements of it competently. Do exams really prepare us for this future? Educators of the future 
curriculum teaching educators of the future, will be on the classroom and will continue to do so, and as education changes to suit the future's needs, the role of a teacher must also adapt and grow. It is each teacher's responsibility to empower students to take risks, be innovative and seize any opportunity thrown their way. In light of a shift towards a more personalized learner experience, teachers of the future must be prepared to be data collectors, as well as analysts, planners, collaborators, curriculum experts, synthesizers, problem solvers and researchers. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave comment below. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, sharing this uh, video. Uh, so what we see uh, in this is the role of the teachers plays a significant role. We are no doubt uh, making use of technology, but uh, we are also seeing that the role of teachers plays very important. We talk about the collaborative learning. We talk about bringing technology to classroom. We come back home. Uh, and the role of a teacher is going to be very important. And I have taken some of the questions uh, which are there on the chat box. So for each of the questions, what is mentioned there, I will be answering through some of the slides uh, where we have a questions like, you know, when teacher themselves have studied in education 1.0, how do we train them to adopt to teach the next generation of students to 4.0? Very interesting and very much valid sessions and uh, valid questions. And if you are talking about collaborative learning, during the pandemic, how do you expect children to collaborate and learn? These are definitely the very important questions that we all need to address. And I would be speaking about that going forward in the next slides. But to move ahead, we have to talk or we have to really highlight the importance of teachers who plays a very important role. And how do we address the challenges and the problems? I will be talking about it in the next few slides. Okay. So to start with, what we understand is the learning path is tailor made. Different children learn in a different way. In a particular school, it may be in a faraway location, it may be in a very remote location, there may be a marginalized set of people, children may be with the difference in their abilities, in their ability to learn different economic background, different status of society. Not everybody can learn in the same way. That is where the role of a teacher is going to change in a very big way. The learning path is tailor-made. And assessment should be formative. It is not that at the end of the year or a semester, I prepare a question paper, give them examination, and who scores the highest in the examination, they are the best students in the college. That is no more there. Somebody may be good at art, somebody may be good at dance, somebody may be good at literature, somebody may be good at problem solving. So we need to assess them consistently over a period of time in a time that is being fixed allotted, maybe every one month or two months, once every two weeks, we start assessing them. So this is where the formative assessment comes rather than having a summative assessment. And teachers should become more of mentors rather than just being a teacher. We need to be empathetic and try to understand their problems. And divergence and pluralism must be present because the more diverse the teaching is, the better we tend to learn the things. And students need not be trained, sorry, the students need to be trained and not to be taught. Instead of teaching uh, you know, the regularly in the classroom, Rather, we need to train them and develop the learner's ability to apply the new technology. Now, let me address this particular question. That there was a question in the chat box asking when the teachers themselves are trained in 1.0 and they're working in far remote schools. I know Filipino government is doing a great job by opening a lot of public schools. In many of the countries, we see that the private schools are taking domination. But in Philippines, I see that there are a lot of public schools which are there. And teachers are putting all their efforts, sacrificing a lot of other lucrative careers and jobs for teaching the students. But they all learned in education 1.0. They all face the hardships in life. Now that you know they want to adopt to education 4.0. Now, if I ask a student to adopt to technology, first I should have adopted to technology. There is a very big challenge. Infrastructure challenge is there. Internet challenge is there. Affordability of electronic gadgets is a big challenge. How do I make use of technology is a big challenge. So I'll be talking about each of the challenges that we face and then the strategies that we are going to follow to overcome the same things. And students should learn how to find it rather than the teacher offering the rigid structure. So there is a saying which goes it. 
you feed them a fish they will come and ask you every day you teach them how to fish they will start finding food for themselves every day so we have to teach them how to fish not feed the fish every day and learner should grow with the knowledge and skills not only to perform the task or the job the life skills are going to be very important not only how do i do deal with my job how do i deal with my family members how do i deal when the problem comes how do i deal when pandemic comes how do i deal with uncertainties because we all live in the world of uka whatever i mentioned in the beginning of the class and how do i handle different phases of my life how do you face different phases of life how do i be emotionally stable this is the kind of the skills that has to be delivered and teachers are going to play a very important role there and some of you have had this question on the chat box asking that you know with the advent of google and with the advent of artificial intelligence do you think that the role of teacher is going to be very important still relevant i say definitely yes when a kid can google everything in uh, internet and when a kid can find something on through an artificial intelligence which delivers them through mobile applications is there a relevance for teacher yes technology cannot replace teachers so what i all have to tell is computers cannot encourage children they cannot motivate they cannot touch their lives they cannot inspire but actually a good teacher can it is always a teacher who stood out and held our hands and told that you can become something and it was not the technology who told us to become like that i still remember a question that was asked to my teacher that i went to my teacher in a history class when i was in school and i asked my teacher that you are teaching us history history is all about the past why should i learn history because i am going to live in the future the teacher is teaching me history very beautifully articulated and i see everything is about the past and i am going to live in the future so what should i do knowing history and my teacher told only one thing which continues to inspire even today that my teacher said my child if you want to create a history of your own you should know what history is and i don't think so any technology would have inspired me so much and this is where the teachers stand different a technology that is attempting to teach without inspiring the pupil with a desire to learn is hammering on a cold iron technology is definitely there there is lot of things technology offers to children today but what if you are trying to hit an iron which is cold it will never bend it will never turn into a shape that we want to it is the teacher who ignite the fire of desire in the children and make them hot and they create a hungerness for the education and make the children learn this is what teacher can do technology can never do everything that a teacher do does but a teacher can learn everything that is offered by technology which is relevant to their field of teaching and we have seen most of the teachers who have been in the positions today you never turned out to be a great teacher on one fine day you were unbiased you connected with children you try to give them something before they actually needed before they actually asked for you protected them even i am a professor you know we may say i don't say students we can, we say them as we call them as children because we know they are our future and we tried to be flexible and we were very empathetic and we started listening to them we understood what their problems are we heeded to their emotions we wiped their tears and we connected with children we connected with parents we connected with society and then we structured education and delivered whenever it was actually required and we made children to be fearless and to go and face the outside world and we ask them to become integral part of the society and all the things what you as a teacher did do you think and technology can do i don't think so an artificial intelligence can come and do this i don't think so a robot can actually come and do this but still there is a question that was asked that will technology replace teacher and my answer is this technology won't replace teachers but teachers who use technology will replace those who don't so it is inevitable on our part 
mandatory on our part whether we like it or not we have to learn technology yes as a teacher i might have studied in 1.0 i do not know how to teach in education 4.0 and who should take responsibility first the teacher themselves should take the responsibility and willingness to learn the second thing the schools and education institutions should provide ample of information and communication technology infrastructure and training to teachers to learn and adopt a new way of learning and deliver the same thing and the government should support the initiatives and the society should support philanthropists may have to come business people may have to come government has to come parents have to come teachers themselves have to come forward and children also should develop the willingness to learn in a new way it is not the individual responsibility of the teacher that i will learn everything by myself no it is a collective responsibility of all of us but remember though i may be a businessman i may come and contribute i may be a government i may make policies i may be a philanthropist i may donate i may be a parent i may come and give a suggestion but ultimately everything boils down to a teacher where they have to capitalize on the support provided by all other stakeholders develop the willingness to learn learn constantly learn more than what is required by their students and then deliver it and when we deliver it don't forget the core qualities of a leader and blend it with the technology and develop it and it requires interest it requires willingness it requires investments it requires right direction it requires an approach it requires training who has to do all of us have to do or all of us have to take the onus of on shoulders simply sitting at one place and telling that we need to have the best education system does not work just making the policies will not actually work the reason is there are several challenges that all of us have to address let us quickly try to take a look at what kind of challenges are going to be posed by education 4.0 i'm sure this slide will talk about the questions what you people have posted institutions classroom size somebody asked me what is the normal classroom size in india normal classroom size varies from 40 to 60 there are 40 students in some of the education institutions in some of the schools or colleges and it goes up to 60 now the question comes if you have to go for a collaborative learning or a blended learning or personalized learning can you teach all those 60 students no it is not possible within that one hour or one and a half hour span of time so the classroom size is being reduced now from 20 to 40 and now not only in the classroom we teach the bigger cohort of students we also split them into groups and we form group activities where we split them into five or six in a group they may give a group presentation they may go for presenting a case study in a group they may go and solve problems in the group but how the teacher facilitate the group now i can bring it down from 60 to 6 in a group i can bring down from 60 to 10 in a group and i can deliver so there are limitations but it all depends on a teacher how well we can bring out the things but a teacher themselves may not be very innovative and open to all the things what is happening in the outside world it is the responsibility of the institutions it is the responsibility of the department of the education and it is the department uh, it is the duty of the government to bring the innovative methods in teaching we have to give so that people will become receptive and learn and challenge of underlying infrastructure and communication technology not everybody may have the electronic gadgets even if we have we may not have internet if we have internet we may not have the power when power comes internet issues are there internet if mobile signals may not be there i know how what kind of challenges you people are facing or rather we are facing because india is a bigger country with almost 130 crore people with more than 718 districts and 28 states 22 languages i still understand how the rural india work we still have challenges and we also have the action plans what i will be discussing going forward and student attitudes and behaviors some are good some of them we have to fine tune and polish student teacher ratio many schools in india are still run in the remote areas by only one or two teachers they teach maybe five or six classes the student teacher ratio is very high at the government schools we have to bring it down we have to hire at least a million teacher in the next 10 years that is what the india plans to do and skilled and qualified teacher Te becoming a teacher is not a great thing because we may you may get a job and you are called as a teacher 
but do i have the skill to connect with children and deliver and inspire them what they want to become qualification just does not mean that i own a degree am i qualified to deliver what is required and understand what is the important things and how the society and industry responds to the institutions and ultimately whether there is a leadership which can drive the agenda everything boils down to the leadership the leadership is going to define and tell whether we really want this or not this is the challenges faced by the institution of course institutions have to invest on infrastructure the building the classrooms uh, bringing in the modern technology lot of money goes in investments or the government has to invest in all these things and coming to teachers if i say i am a professor and i have a doctorate and i don't want to learn what i know is eternal that i am gone i should have the willingness to learn rather i should be more willing to learn than my students and teachers should get access to resources libraries are important digital libraries are important online libraries are important open massive courses are important and we lack access and not everybody is able to embrace technology because the way they grew up and the way they turned out to be teachers over a period of time they might have not used technology at all and for a person who has not used technology at all how do you expect them to go and teach the new set of generation with the new technologies adequate training is required serving mindset teacher job is not that i just get my salary at end of every month that is something all of you know we should have the mindset of being a servant leader acquire innovative skills develop and retain the organization culture how because we all form a culture the cohorts of the faculty or the teachers form a culture and students does everybody have access to gadgets no some of us may have gadgets at home because we have affordability not everybody in a rural area or every child has a gadget i see some of the examples in my own country case where there is a mobile phone for a child at home and there is no signals there is accessibility of internet is in a different location they go to a different location they climb the trees they go on the top floor of somebody house and they try to see what the teacher is teaching and they may not really know how to make use of google classroom or probably the zoom or webex internet connectivity issues are there we talk a lot about information and communication technology but grassroots level problems exist if i am talking about online education if there is no internet how good gadgets you have how good teacher you are how good collaborator you are it does not make sense technical issues are there and poverty people cannot afford first of all coming to chill you know children coming to school itself is a challenging task because children will start working because they have to feed their families the poverty exists where do i expect them to come to school buy a gadget and learn all the things family factor parents say that what will you do learning education come start a job with me work in my office work in my shop work in the agriculture field come back you you also start earning and you also contribute towards family managing distractions maybe several applications maybe facebook whether children face book or not i don't know they will be on facebook that is been the trend today there are several distractions you have so much available on internet and that distracts and handling the screen stress if i'm sitting in front of the screen for a day entire day the stress is there now the government also face big challenges the first important challenge the government lacks today is we need visionary leaders people who can empathize people who are not only called politicians they are called as statesmen who can say that i know i not only know what is required for my country for today i also know what my country requires for the next 10 years i know what my country requires for the next 20 years we need visionary leaders and leaders are required at all levels it may be at the political level it may be at the administrative level it may be at the university level and they should be able administrators how many of them we have actually forward thinkers how do i take things forward right advisors giving good advice is different from giving a right advice and bringing in holistic education which talks about the overall development of a child not just that scoring marks and can we pump in money or funds into facilitating education functions right how much of money goes for investments in education in every country we talk about roads we talk about health yes which are very important i don't deny that fact infrastructure projects but how much of money gets pumped into education i believe and consider this is the most priority area education 
health. These are the two primary or significant area where investment is required for boosting education and health because physical and mental health also impacts education, which is of an important element. And curriculum and the pedagogy. How the government is going to develop the curriculum for the future, how they bring the think tanks, how they bring the subject matter experts and create a pedagogy for the future. So these are all the challenges that we are all going to face. Now, not only these challenges, we also have some additional challenges. What is the traditional challenges as the perceivers of education that we are going to have? Informal learning will force formal learning to change its course. More than the classroom, we are all going towards informal learning. What do I learn? How do I learn? Where do I find it? Machine learning will be in race with human learning. Machines will start learning and they will start educating the children uh, the way they have to actually learn. Machine will start understanding what you are good at, what you are not good at, how, how can it bring the best out of you. Artificial intelligence as a curriculum designer for individual learners. I'll just take up a quick survey. Our parents will attempt a survey about their child and your system will tell you what kind of education you require. Native knowledge and experience seeking level playing field with the global practices. That is why India has come up with a concept called as global. You know, there should be globalization and there should be localization. We have to create local citizens for the global markets. That is the kind of approach we need to be observing. And newer concepts of evaluation and certification. How do we evaluate people? And we need new generation teachers. Because these are not just the challenges that we face because of Industry 4.0. We also face several other challenges. Today, we see that more than 262 million children and youth are out of school. And we want to bring all these children back to school because they are not coming maybe due to poverty or due to giving support to the family or some social unrest in the family or family issues or domestic issues, whatever the issues are. Children are out of schools. We have to bring them back. And it is the duty of the teachers to bring them back because parents may not send. So we not only need to educate children, we also need to educate parents, ask them, why is that your child is not coming? I know it is not an easy task, but we all have to do it. There is nobody else who will do it other than teachers. Take it from me. Six out of 10 are not acquiring basic literacy anywhere after seven several years in schools. So they go to schools, and they spend time, they learn, they play around and they come back. But then the literacy is still not there because the way the teaching was delivered to them, it was having lacuness. Maybe because the number of children were more, the teacher could not concentrate on everybody or the students come to school on one day, next day they may not come. They may not be attentive. They are worried about the problems in the family. Their minds are not opening up. And 750 million adults are illiterate, fueling poverty and marginalization. So this is the statistics that we try to see or we see across the world what is actually happening and in a country like India, what are the kind of problems we are facing? So what we need to do here is we have to follow the sustainable development goals which are being set by the UNESCO. So as quality education is one of the important agenda for the next 10 years, so we all have to have the primary agenda towards empowering the people of our country, irrespective of whether they are elders or mid-aged or children or school going students, whoever it is, to empower them with the knowledge, skills, value to live in dignity and build our own life to face the uncertain future and contribute towards a better society. So here, I believe that the government hold the main responsibility for ensuring the right quality to education. The 2030 agenda is a universal and collective com commitment that we all have to deliver. If you see the people on the right side in the last picture, there are three people, the representatives, the, the administrators, the chief minister of Delhi in India. All of you have heard about the place called Delhi in India. They have transformed education and healthcare significantly. Do you believe that happiness is part of their curriculum to children? Teaching children or training them or understanding them the importance of being happy. I read this statement somewhere. It is not that when I have money, I will be happy. It is not that when I am more educated, I will be happy. It is not that 
when i am more successful i will be happy they said you be happy then you will be more successful you be happy you will get better qualification and you will learn more you be happy money will automatically come in search of you because happiness if you have it and it can lead to many things so this is where the government of delhi is investing they have doubled their investments on education schools have been redesigned the mode of education delivery has changed teacher exchange programs are there teachers are sent to different universities across the world teachers have been trained they have been given the gadgets and we see that they say that education is the future of delhi and that is what we are trying to deliver and in continuation to this the government of india has come up with no doubt you know there is a progress in the leadership that you people are observing in a country like india the kind of leadership which is going at a global level the prime minister has taken the initiatives as to how the things have to be for the next 10 20 years and a trigger for requirement has come into picture where how we need to not only define education we also have designed the education and what remains now is how are we going to deliver the education so now we before we start discussing about the education 4.0 in indian context uh, we will take a quick 2 minutes break and then we will come back meanwhile if you have any questions you can put it on the chat box and going forward i'll be taking those questions so we will join back and continue to discuss about the national education policy of india we will have a quick 2 minutes break and then we are back yeah thank you and uh, welcome back again so so far uh, we discussed about education 4.0 we saw how it is actually defined as i told you in the beginning we are talking about how education 4.0 is defined is important and how it is going to be designed is important and how it is going to be delivered is also important so defined part of it is something that we have discussed so far and now we will move on to how it is actually being designed okay so 
going forward, we see that how India is embracing Education 4.0. I would like to quote this statement before we move to the next slide. That if a child can't learn the way we teach, when I say the child can't learn, we all have learned as children. But going forward, the future generation kids, the kind of skills that they have to develop, if they are not able to develop those skills for tomorrow, by the way we are teaching, the way we learned yesterday, maybe we should teach the way they learn. It is not that student have to change for what the way we are teaching rather we should change the way we teach to the students so let us quickly have a look at the national education policy of india and how it is impacting the future of indian education so all of you must be aware india is a very vast country uh, rich in heritage culture and resources. India has 28 states. We have nine union territories and 718 districts. Probably you may consider that as a province or uh, the state may be considered as a province is something that you have to tell me on that. And unlike many countries across the world, we don't have one single language. We have 22 regional languages. English, of course, is one common language people talks, and we have Hindi as our national language, but different states also have their own regional languages. And there are several sub-languages which are existing. And we have six geographical locations, the desert part, the east coast, the west coast, like this we have six. And we have over 1.5 million schools, which are private and public, where in some of the schools, there may be 10 children, in some of the schools, there may be 3,000 children. So there is a lot of diversity that we see in a country like India. And we have bigger challenges that needs to be addressed. Just discussion will not take us a long way. What's more important is how we have designed it and how we are going to deliver makes all the difference. And some of the other statistics that we see, we are a population of 130 crore people. And population which is between 15 to 24 years is close to 246,000 that we actually see. And we can also see the total population by age group. You can see or you can refer to these slides later as to how the demographic setup is there in India. However, we see one interesting thing on the right hand side top corner where I'm moving my cursor is literacy rate is been increasing over a period of time. So the literacy in male is increasing, the literacy in female is increasing, the overall literacy there is a growth. And when you can see the right hand bottom side corner slide, it shows that the illiterate population is declining. It means that, so if the illiteracy is declining, it means that again, the literacy is gaining momentum. And we have pre-primary children, primary, secondary and tertiary, where the number of children going to these pre-primary and primary over a period of time, it is increasing. So we see that the momentum of education is growing good in India. But can we afford to sit quiet thinking that everything will go fine? With the current education system, do you think we can address the world which is called VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complexity and ambiguity? Can we really address such kind of future? No, it is not. So we definitely needed a much better education policy. So the education policy vision talks about this. To have an education system that contribute to an equitable and vibrant knowledge society. And we have to provide high quality education. As I mentioned, offering quality education is one of the sustainable goal of UNESCO also. And we have to adhere to it. And we have to give vibrant knowledge to the people in the society. And develop a sense of respect towards the fundamental rights and duties of individuals as well as the constitutional values. We not only need to create citizens, we have to create a responsible citizens of not only the country, but the responsible citizens of the world. Because 
we have to change our way we deliver our duties and responsibilities according to the changes that are taking place in the outside world instill the skills among the children and the students and inculcate the values the value system the character building becomes a prime importance here and commitment towards human rights because what is the world without human beings it is the human who are the one which are of prime importance and it is the humans who can actually destroy the world or uh, we can also create this to be a very beautiful place so we have to have right values and human rights have to be respected and appreciated and we have to go for a sustainable development no doubt today we are all talking about digital disruption which is talking about the future which can be disruptive but we also need to look at the sustainability which is going to exist in the long run which can bring the well being of people and truly becoming global citizens so this is our vision for national education policy 2020 now what are our key principles respect for diversity and local context as i told you india is a land of diversity but education is bringing unity people say india is a land of unity in diversity we have different culture we have different caste we have different religions uh, we have different languages we have different states we have different ways of living society differ but we need to respect each and everybody's diversity at the same time we have to bring in unity in all curriculum pedagogy and the policy there should be there and equity and inclusion right so all as the cornerstones of all education decisions there should be equity which has to be brought in the community participation as i told everybody has to participate the private people the philanthropists the parents the uh, bureaucrats the administrators the uh, any anybody we talk about everybody has to participate and bringing in the use of technology right so this is where i need i want to address some of your questions where if the teachers are not used to technology it is our duty to take the technology towards the teachers train them how to make use of technology and deliver it now without even giving them the gadgets let us not ask a question whether they will learn or not let us not ask a question whether they will use it properly or not first let us give them and train them and not that everything should go as per our expectations we have to make sure things should go based on doing it rather than just thinking about it emphasize conceptual understanding rather than me trying to go and by hearting something you know people have the habit of learning they just by heart answers uh, you know they repeat 10 times the same answer and they know answer they write in exam but they don't know applicability of it so that has to be stopped and recognize the unique capability of individual somebody may be very good in sports they may lose opportunities for future somebody is good in singing they lost opportunities somebody was good in drawing and painting they tend to lose out the opportunities there so the unique capabilities have to be identified and critical thinking and creativity has to be given importance and there should be a continuous review of the education as well as the curriculum by the experts so these are the key principles based on which the national education policy is been designed and we have to ensure universal access to education at all levels everybody must be in a position to access all levels of education not that you know in the village levels or at the towns or in the corners or in the remote areas they have access only to schools primary schools and many remote area school children will never come to higher education at all because of lack of accessibility lack of affordability so we have to provide them multiple pathways learn formally and informally build schools which are going to be important schools need not be only built by the government it can be built by the private players also promote them schools can be built by the government by the donations that is been received by the philanthropist take the successful people of a particular locality and ask them to donate for building a better schools or having better teachers because end of the day it is all our social responsibility towards the nation and focus on learning outcomes not just what syllabus we have learned and importantly bring back dropouts this is something that all of us have to address here if children have left the school it is our duty to bring back yes it is painful for me to go and talk to their parents their parents may, may scold me their parents may say who are you to ask my child to come back i have my problems my child will earn for my family will you come and give me money if my child comes to your school all kinds of questions are there but we need to educate parents today because 
it is not their mistake because that is the way they are leading their life and it is making them to think like that the problem of dropouts the gross enrollment ratios what we really talk about today that has to be on a higher scale and have alternate centers innovative education centers say for example in the location where i am there there is a government school which is deprived of facility and there is one of the private school which has all infrastructure and one uh, school private school has everything that is required or beyond what is required and there is another school where there is no bare minimum facilities now what the education policy proposes is bring collaboration among the schools try to have alternate centers where where children are deprived in the private public schools or public sector schools or the government schools on a weekend when the private school is not operating they can try to make use of the infrastructure and there are educators who can train them and teach them that is where the collaboration between the private school and the public sector school comes into picture and peer tutoring is another important thing that we try to look into and how the children will learn for the future these are all part of the national education policy so transforming curricular and pedagogical structure so let us see how it was existing earlier if you see these uh, the cubicles on the screen how it was looking earlier is you know we had uh, schooling where uh, the primary and secondary high school was there and then we had the college education so two years you see the college education which was 11th and 12th standard and prior to that it was first standard to 10th standard means class 1 to class 10 and then it was 11th and 12th standard this was what we call as pre university college they used to go and in this two years they were choosing a particular subject of their choice maybe they pursue science they pursue commerce or they pursue arts but the new academic structure has been completely changed the first five years of their education is multi level and it is only activity based learning give them art give them craft make them play give them a problem to solve and bring collaboration and they have to learn only based on activities so this is the five years of learning so when it comes to five years of learning first three years they are going to go to the schools like the smaller schools or the preschool what we call as or the play group at the age of 3 to 6 and they do activity based learning and then they come to class 1 and class 2 this is between class 6 to 8 at this stage if you can see here in the 5 years the foundation stage we want them to learn by playing by doing activities and multi level activities and then comes is 3 to 5 class 3 class 4 class 5 that is between the age group of 8 to 11 this is what we call as preparatory level the first level was called as the foundational level where we have to give them the values we have to teach them teach them about the integrity we have to teach them about ethics we have to give them all the foundational course related to science maths and other things and here it is the preparatory stage where they still continue to play and they start discovering new things and again it is going to be more of activity based and interactive classroom learning they will start interacting they will be formed into groups and they will start developing the classroom learning this is between 3 to 5 that is class 3 to class 5 and coming to class 6 to 8 there will be another 3 years between the age group of 11 to 14 years old children where experiential learning will happen in the field of science you may take them to the farm fields and teach them how the crop grows you may take them to a uh, scientific uh, research center and teach them how the defense is going to develop their equipments you may take them to industries and try to bring them exposure as to how the industries work you may take them to the post office and see how the postal system works we teach them mathematics we bring in arts social sciences this is where the children between class 6 to class 8 is going to grow but the big change that you see here earlier 10 years were there from class 1 to class 10 and then there used to be 2 years of education here we see that the 2 years is now converted into 4 years that is the two bottom levels are taken away by this particular layer that is instead of class 11 and 12 we have made it 4 years where class 9 to 12 has come where children between the age of 14 and 16 fall under this category earlier 16 and 18 were falling under this category now 14 and 16 are 14 and 18 are falling under this category that is from 2 years now we have moved this to 4 years 
and this is what we call as secondary going forward so in this secondary what do they learn that is they will learn multidisciplinary earlier i used to choose my commerce science or arts at the age of 16 but now i can choose at the age of 14 not only that earlier if i take science i learn only science subjects i take commerce i learn only commerce subject i take arts i learn only arts subject no but here it is multidisciplinary i can choose physics i can choose accounting and i can choose economics i can choose biology i can choose mathematics and i will choose sociology so now you have been given a choice to choose the kind of course that you really want to learn and bring in greater critical thinking and flexibility to make the choice of subjects that you want to learn the students are going to choose so you can think you can see that no more it is going to be confined that i am an expert in one area you will have the holistic knowledge and development towards the future and early childhood education learning from the formative years so develop the curiosity among the children for the early childhood education and bring in the logical thinking skills and problem solving skills but let me tell one thing you may be thinking that okay all these looks good on the powerpoint but how do we really apply it and who is going to apply all these things as i told it is the teachers a country's power lies in the empowerment of the teachers if the country want to progress empower the teachers it may be the head of the institution it may be the university head from body from the department of education a bureaucrat if the teachers are not empowered they can never empower children and if em children are not empowered a country can never empower all these things we have to bring in let me show the root map the implementation plan that we actually have and bring them the art craft music and they have to develop the relationship with nature which is important i should understand the importance of trees importance of water importance of the ecosystem because nature is unbiased nature does not care whether i am rich or poor whether i am educated or not it does not today you see that the pandemic has really made the world upside down but somebody was responsible somewhere not only that there may be several natural calamities disasters we need to understand and develop nature and we need to contribute towards the growth of better nature color shape alphabets i am talking all these things about the formative years that is early childhood education children should not be more in silos they should go for teamwork they have to be with the society they have to play and learn and develop moral values and ethics and they should have a self identity i should never say i am a son of a rich politician i am a son of a rich businessman i am a son of a rich parents my parent is a my father is a ceo of a company of course those things are fine but still we should have an identity of our own i should be a person who says i am a man of character i am a man of moral values i am a child who can solve the problems that is where the self identity should start coming in this will boost their self esteem the kind of etiquettes and behavior and emotional development has to take place and there is a need for attainment of foundation literacy and numeracy in place that is what we actually require by grade 3 in the mission mode when i say the grade 3 we are all looking to achieve this at this level let me show you grade 3 where it comes so it comes at the grade 3 here from the age of 8 they will start learning these things where foundation skills are already done we need to understand the national mission is focusing on developing the foundational literacy as well as numeracy the book promotion the national book promotion policy will formulate and public the school libraries will be expanded so we have to bring in more and more books because children should read books people may say yeah, when online learning is there when we have uh, you know when we have the videos uh, when we have people talking to us why should we read books reading books are important because one difference i have found the importance of reading book is when i read the book i talk to myself and when i talk to myself that is the most powerful communication that can actually do with myself and early learning is important in the grade 3 3 month play based school is important children will just go and play whatever games they want they may play independent games group games collaborative games it can be anything and the national repository high quality teaching and learning resources is coming on diksha this is where the government of Inici india initiatives are there and school libraries including digital libraries to be leverage so we have to bring in the digital libraries and give access not only to children give access even to the teachers as well and how the curriculum is going to look like 
bring down the syllabus or the textbook contents and try to retain only core contents don't let us not try to dump things with too much where too much you know is going to go into their heads and they don't really actually remember important things and focus on an inquiry into the nature let them discover and discuss something say for example uh, i have been uh, hearing about the stories uh, i was taught in my childhood days lion is the king of the forest and very recently a small kid came and asked me this question where i did not have an answer if you say lion is the king of the forest who made a lion as the king of the forest if lion is going to catch and eat animals do you think you can call him as a king now the child was hardly 4 years right so do we have answers for all this so we say that these are all the stories that we used to communicate now when i teach something about lion of the forest i should never teach that lion will catch and eat animals because if i say that how can you make somebody of a person of this character a king so students and children will start asking questions i'm sure most of you on a daily basis you must be wondering how to answer your kids when they are asking the kind of questions that comes into your their mind but we should promote that kind of a thinking and make classes to be more and more interactive don't deliver at one level of course in this session i am trying to be more at one way because uh, of the limitations that we have on right when i take the regular classes for my student i try to keep it interactive we discuss we collaborate we do the things but we have a limitations here that is where it is becoming more of one way but let me answer all your questions at last but classes should be interactive make them into groups split them into groups give them the activities and bring the experiential learning that is where they have to learn by experience not that i just go online and pay the bills and come back send the child to pay the bills stand in the queue and they may experience different people they may see people without having access to technology they may see underprivileged people and they will start appreciating how privileged they are so make them get experienced of everything let them go to agriculture lands and try to plow the land and try to experience how we grow rice and focus on learning outcomes competencies and subject integrations of important competency based education we have to develop our not only the knowledge we have to develop the skills and competencies do not work in silos work in groups and integration of subjects with information and communication technology the subject need not be taught only by using the books it can be taught by using the videos by using technology emphasis on digital library no doubt the books are also going to be important but digital library is also important because when they go back home they may not have all access to all the books in your library they may go to digital library and they may access it and also not only offer them the books and library offer them digital literacy so that how they can access all the resources that are there online bring them the digital literacy how to use computers how to do the coding how to do the thinking and how to do the reasoning and development of scientific temper and promotion of multilingual teaching because in a country like india we have almost 22 regional languages so we teach we teach english we teach hindi also and we teach the regional language also there should be flair of local that is a regional language there should be flair of national language and there should be flair of a language which is accepted universally which is again english and not just giving them education give them a better mental health as well as the physical status also which is very important regular health check up for the children reduce weight of school books make it more activity based and bring in health and wellness as the mandatory skills counselors are important to handle the emotional stress of students and focus on children with disability we call them as special child and inclusive and caring culture at school so we should be very caring so i read this statement somewhere why we should be caring because this is how children will look like no one cares how much you know i'll repeat again no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care so that care is required and it can be delivered only by teachers not by any technology and bring in the innovative pedagogy these are all part of india's national education policy experiential learning integrated pedagogy promotion of peer tutoring giving equal weightage having bagless days there is a proposal where children uh, will go to schools without bags they just go they play they interact they collaborate they learn and they come back 
in an academic calendar you should have something called as bagless day don't carry bags just go have fun and enjoy life use of use and integration of the technology so here india's future and india's leadership role in the upcoming fields focus on the computational thinking mathematical thinking and deliver the contemporary subjects and also provide them the knowledge about your own country because we have to be proud about our country our culture our heritage and we should know what is happening within my country i know how my country uh, have evolved over a period of time that we need to teach to the next generation we give them the ability to take decision at the younger age we should tell them the inspiring stories and we should teach them ethics the moral values being more empathetic and bring in them the traditional values however the modern things we may do but traditional values are very very important because those are the foundations for our future and give them the training related to health nutrition and articulate things in a nice manner bring in all the knowledge into a nutshell and try to train and teach them and give them the overall scope about uh, children in urban cities or urban area should know how the tribal people live and the curriculum has to be designed in such a way that it inspires children for the future and give the scientific explanations why is alcohol consumption bad how it may uh, impact your health why is tobacco bad why is drugs so what are the do's and what are the don'ts how i keep not only my education healthy how i also keep myself healthy in terms of my health and examinations are not going to be any more like a book oriented you are going to have the formative assessments you are going to assess the child on a regular basis key stages will be there at the 3 to 5 level or at the level 8 we are going to do the key assessments and we have to achieve the learning outcomes the learning outcomes is not just passing in examination whether they have really learned the subject and whether they are able to implement and reforming examinations in grade 9 to 12 we are coming up with something called nta that is national testing agency which is going to come with a standardized procedure for assessing the students the exams are going to be made more easier but in terms of this examination should not just be the outcome of the marks they score it should be the outcome to tell them what they are good at and what they are actually lacking bringing the viable models teachers are to be prepared for the transformation and each school board shall ensure equivalent academic standards are maintained means there should be consistency in education there should not be disparity why should this child be deprived of that and why should only that child get everything but of course school may be a private school they may be offering you the best of the infrastructure that is different but when the content of subject comes into picture there should be equity over there and transforming the culture of assessment how do i assess my child which is very important continuous track or track them continuously and if at the higher level you can go for an artificial intelligence based software but of course it requires a lot of investments information and communication technology infrastructure that is there and have a national assessment center which is going to talk about how the assessments have to be done at each levels and give importance to self assessment also or peer assessment i talk about how my friend performs a friend talks about how i perform this is where the national training agency will work to offer high quality common aptitude test for all the children across to eliminate the need for taking coaching for these exams separately there will be a single test and come up with a holistic progress card the progress card should not just be about my examination scores it it should be my cumulative score record did i participate in sports did i participate in culture did i display ethical value did i do team work did i display leadership qualities did i do some social concern projects so my progress card should be inclusive of all these things my teacher should evaluate me my friend should evaluate me my juniors in school evaluate me my parents should evaluate me and i should evaluate myself this is where the holistic progress card comes into picture and in a country like india we are trying to bring in the multilingualism and the power of language learning that is where uh, we see that we are going with the three levels of uh, subjects in terms of the language the english the hindi as well as the regional language of that particular state i am from karnataka bangalore what we call kannada uh, state called tamil nadu talks tamil but state in uh, india called kerala talks about malayalam okay that is the regional language and still we try to bring those things into picture and how the schools are going to be 
small children will go to bal bhavan this i am talking from the government schools perspective and kids also go to private schools okay bal bhavan bal means children bhavan means a place a school or a shelter and that particular place should have sharing of resources there should be a level of efficiency in terms of delivering the education a proper planning is required the governance of schools are important whether simply i do a policy and leave it or i govern whether things are happening or not bring in the integration connect schools connect teacher do the teacher exchange programs a teacher from a private school will go to government school a teacher from the government school will come to private school and they try to understand one another how the things are shaping up pairing the schools that is a school which has all the facilities will be paired with the schools with under privileged facilities and standard setting and accreditations all schools have to be accredited based on common standards we don't we should not differentiate based on just looking at the building of the schools it talks about the teacher the teachability the curriculum the pedagogy the values that they are going to actually deliver there set up several boards and the constitute several uh, institutions which can actually govern these things and coming to the teachers this is a big challenge where many of you had the questions for me i think this slide should be the answer so when we are talking about the teacher education so not just that teacher talks about teaching the students we are talking about teaching the teachers or educating the teachers and there is a time frame which is required if somebody asked me sir i don't have a teacher who has studied in education 4.0 how do you think we can do no we can't achieve everything in a single day i'm sure philippines is a very big country it has several islands it has far remote places like india you too have challenges and like every country you too have challenges and the way you have challenges even we have challenges and every other countries have challenges we can't achieve in one single day we take time we may take a decades time start now so four year integrated bachelor of education course will be mandatory for a teacher to become a teacher in the near future if you are already a degree holder you still have to undergo two years of bachelor of education course if you have a masters degree you should still do one year of bachelor of education course because this bachelor of education course is mainly focused on teaching and training the teachers how to teach the next generation students teacher education will gradually be moved to 2030 into multidisciplinary colleges and universities this is how the teacher education have to shape for the future and improving the teacher education all of us have to take collective responsibility new and comprehensive national framework is been done all teacher education will be done in multidisciplinary institutions and at the same time there will be a national testing agency which is also going to test whether the person is eligible to become teacher or not there are going to be merit based scholarships stringent action against substandard stand alone education systems and setting up the national mission for mentoring the large pool of people and we need to come up with national higher education regulatory council that is what is going to be set up and come up with teacher eligibility test at all stages if i am a primary teacher and if i have to go to become a teacher of a secondary or a high school if i have to be promoted i have to pass the test and the test will be conducted by one single agency so future of teachers in a country like india is going to be very big challenge and teacher recruitment and deployment also is going to be a big challenge for us so we have to hire the teachers based on their willingness their ability their skills and we are going to bring in the technology to hire the teachers now you may ask question okay for new teachers this is there but for existing teachers what to do yes the question is the point is for existing teachers improve the teachers education with the new teachers go for hiring the better ones and allow them to grow professionally allow them to grow personally ask them to do courses how many teachers have learned something beyond their education levels today tell me honestly if there is a school teacher or a high school teacher they might have done a degree course or a uh, diploma course or they might have done a bachelor of education course after that they never pursued any further education 
they never ventured you know ventured into learning something new they never did that of course they had limitations but we also did not promote them we have to take equal responsibility so allow them to do courses let them pursue new things which is going to percolate to the next levels and have a transparent transfer system right and restructure the entire education system through the teachers this is where empowering of teachers comes through technology offering them career growth and giving them the autonomy to teach in the classrooms developing academic leadership and creating a sense of service environment throughout and what are the key focus areas that we are actually look into focus area should be towards even the socio economically disadvantaged groups there are many students from lower economic sector maybe from a different religion maybe from a different caste maybe they are underprivileged maybe from a family of poor or poverty so bring them all together we have to make sure they also become part of education because we can't let anybody to go away we have to hold each other hands and we have to pull them up now the role of teacher is not easy and again we may be deprived about so many facilities for the future but still this is a noble profession we have to take it on our shoulders and we have to bring them up ensure equity among everybody equality is different and equity is different equality is i let us assume equality is i give one one orange to everybody or where it's equity is give a little more to somebody who is more hungry give a little to somebody who is probably less hungry that is where equity comes end of the day all of us have to have the same level of satisfaction filling the stomach have the similar kind of learnings learning should be based on outcomes there should be interventions of several education bodies and we are going to have special education zones and waive off the fees for the children if they cannot afford and or if they are really good bring in the counselors which are important and make sure all the genders are there that is male female all these you know they should be considerately important many schools i'm sure many a villages they say if you are a girl child don't go to it girl child children are most of the time deprived about it no that should not happen everybody has to get equal weightage it may be a boy or a girl it's the children who are the future of any particular country gender sensitivity is taken into consideration and support children with special needs some children has special needs we need to support them they may not be every child is not same and we need to support and allow them to be nurtured in the areas of their interest or what they are actually good at and integrate occasional education at all levels occasional education is not which comes only at the higher levels it should it should start from the school level itself exposure should be there allow them to learn through online do the gap analysis consistently build a skills framework and setting up of parak which is called performance assessment review and analysis of knowledge right and this is mainly for the holistic development to make sure that there are proper assessments and evaluation and it focuses on the holistic development a child or students will grow holistically and support gifts to student gifts to student some children are specially talented they are too good at something support them not everybody has to get a education qualification and they have to get a job somebody may be a very good sportsman somebody may become an athlete somebody may be a singer an artist or a painter an administrator the leader nurture them help them to become what they are good at don't compare one child with another child based on different qualities i can't compare a crocodile with you know elephant right so there is a difference i can't compare a mouse with an lion they have their own plus and they have their own strength and weaknesses children differs from one another we all different from one another and spot the talent what the child has got and nurture that particular talent and bring in online and digital education there is a blend of classroom education and digital education so there was a question here 
sir how do we tend to do collaborative learning in the age of online education where children are not going to schools but don't worry once we have the medicines for pandemic what has been created slowly there will be a medicines which can cure the people who are facing the problem and it will remove the fear that i may be infected in the near future we will all come back to schools of course this year it may be definitely challenging for all of us to do the collaborative learning going to schools or college because we also are doing online education currently but still even in online education we can go for breakout sessions and we can still go for collaborative learning that all depends on the skills of a teacher not sure everybody will have that particular knowledge until they are trained but yes that is one lackiness all of us may have for the next one year until the pandemic gets over and uh, online education uh, we offer through something called as swayam that you can see on the right hand side there is one nation one digital platform in india which is called as swayam which is going to offer the inclusion and access to everybody blended learning is going to be there content creation are happening and uh, we are offering them the holistic education in different areas of knowledge and adult education and lifelong learning comes into picture where the adults should be well versed with the foundation literacy and numeracy critical life skills are important and vocational training should be there and basic education should be very strong and there should be continuity in learning now till now we defined what education 4.0 was and i showed you how india has designed the education for future for embracing edu education for embracing sorry embracing education 4.0 now we will see how are we going to deliver it based on the time frame i have few more slides left i will quickly conclude in the next few minutes the timeline are we have different phases that is the phase one we are talking about the pre primary school by 2021 we want to achieve all these things and by 23 2023 24 we want to go to the phase two and implementation of new curriculum till ninth standard should happen by 21 22 and 22 23 it should go to 10th and in the subsequent year it should go till 12th standard new board exam pattern will come to class 12th shortly that is by 24 25 in the next 4 to 5 years and new board exam pattern for class 10th is going to come by 2023 so these are all the timelines because a goal without a timeline will remain as a goal a goal with a timeline is always something can be looked forward and achievable so if you have to look at the entire national education policy you may ask me a question when do you think india will be successful achieving all these policies that have been formulated we have the timelines for the next one year the next two years the next five years the next 10 years and for the next 20 years because education is an evolution it is not a revolution and education is no more relevant to only classroom it has changed the dimensions so in this case we see that it takes time if we start today it may take one year or it may take five years but without starting today we cannot go anywhere this is the timeline which you can refer to later based on the government of india guidelines the new features of the policy talks about preparations for schooling and elementary schooling level school infrastructure and resources are very critical holistic development of the student is important other than the classroom learning bringing in the inclusivity of all the people is important that is where the gender inclusion is going to be important both boys schools have to come to colleges assessments are going to be critical as to how do we assess our children and bring a good curriculum and pedagogical framework is another important thing and teacher recruitments and teacher education this is the fund foundation of everything because it is the teachers who are the bridge between what is offered and what is actually required and redefine the role of government departments and the bodies that is why i mentioned the leadership is going to be very critical am i just seeing that my country children are getting educated today or am i thinking about what is required for my country for the next 10 years or for the next 20 years and also there was a national education policy for the higher education as well so far i was been talking about the schools and the higher schools but we also look into something called higher education higher education has been again significantly uh, changed so if we see the higher education level that when we are going to pursue the degree and the post graduation uh, unlike earlier now the children when they go to 3 years degree 
if you complete three years, then only you are called as graduate. But now what they have done in the three years degree, if you complete only first year, you just get a certificate. Now with that certificate, you can still go and join the job and you can work for two years and then come back your second year degree once again. If you complete the two years degree out of three, you will be given a diploma certificate. And if you complete three years, you will be given a graduate. Now, if you want to perceive your masters, somebody after finishing three years of degree can come into two years of masters or if somebody has pursued a four years graduation in the field of engineering, they can get postgraduate with just one year of pursuing the postgraduation. So this is where multiple entry and exit also has taken place. I can do two years of course, go back, work for two years and then pursue the third year. I can do degree today, go and join post-graduation, do only first year of post-graduation, join a job and maybe after two years, again, come back and learn whatever I want to learn. And you will have the choice to make among the subjects that you really want to learn. You can choose multiple subjects and different disciplines as well. So this is where the more opening has been given to the graduation and post-graduation level also. But implementation is definitely a challenge. Because I say that policies have been proposed and there is a long way to go for us before the implementation actually rolls out. But now the question and challenge for all of us is how these policies will be approached and how they are all going to be important. And how we are going to implement is another important thing because policy planning is different and policy implementations are different. At the policy formulation stage, we go sometimes by data, we go by wisdom, we go by intuitions. But when we implement, we go completely by practicality. So this is where the delivery becomes a big challenge for all of us. So we have defined what is education 4.0. We have designed how the future of education should be. Now we are in the mode of delivery. Just to define design and delivery is not important. We have to constantly innovate. We have to constantly find a better way of delivering it. We have to incubate, keep the children, keep the society at warmth. We have to hatch their thinking to come out with greater thoughts. And we have to incorporate agility into curriculum. How the things keep on changing, we have to make sure those inculcation happens or incorporation happens in the curriculum. The syllabus will become more and more agile. In the higher education, we will bring industry experts, we will bring children, we will bring subject matter experts and ask them to design curriculum for us. That is where innovate, incubate and incorporate is important. And education 4.0 is again about bringing and blending with technology. We have to digitize. And just digitizing is not important. We have to decentralize. And we have to go to the grassroots level. We have to percolate it. As the previous speaker spoke in the previous session, what was highlighted by Ami, and I told in the beginning of the session that in the near future, we are all going to live with uncertainty. We do not know what can happen in the future. Things are unpredictable. But still, we want to predict it. So the best way to predict future is to create it. Now, how do we create the near future is a roadmap that is being laid in front of you people. Because if not us, who will do it? If not I and you, who will do it? If not now, when we will do it? So with this, I conclude my session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avinash. It was a very comprehensive and interesting topic. And I'm um, judging from the uh, feedback and appreciation from the both the YouTube and the Zoom chat boxes, um, our participants would not mind that we'll have 15 minutes more extension for our Q and A uh, with you, sir. So let me just start uh, with uh, a question that was raised in our YouTube uh, channel from Mr. Walberto Lantaya of the Zamboanga State College of Marine Sciences and Technology. Okay. How do we go about with Education 4.0 in rural communities, which apparently is far from access to latest technology and quality education? Yes, uh, 
this is a very important question and an important area that we really need to address. As I was mentioning in my talk, uh, the towns and cities, what we call as urban places, have access to all these infrastructure facility and by and large, because of the standard of living of the people is high in urban areas, their affordability towards the new technology, new gadgets or better schools are more easier. But the big challenge lies in rural areas. Now, rural areas have to be focused more because there is a huge population resting there. And if I talk about countries' growth, I should talk about inclusive growth irrespective of whether it is an urban area or a rural area. So we need to focus and formulate policies for children in rural areas where try to bring in more of investments for starting up schools and colleges. Invest in infrastructure. Invest in new technology. And most importantly, the rural teachers have to be trained and they have to be educated more. We have to bring in the change in the culture, the way they work. We have to provide them access to new technology with better infrastructure facilities. And we should ensure that government should create a policy where the big corporates of the country, say in a country like India, we have something called as uh, corporate social responsibility, CSR. A percentage of a private company profits have to be donated towards corporate social responsibilities. So bring in the education says, and all the money should go for investment in the rural areas. And in the rural areas, let me tell you, actually they are more privileged people. They may not have the best of the infrastructure, but with respect to moral values, with respect to ethics, with respect to standing by one another is more in rural areas what I have seen. They already have the fundamental things in place. But giving them access to technology is the responsibility of education institutions, responsibility of entrepreneurs, responsibility of the business houses, responsibility of the corporate houses, responsibility of the philanthropist, and important responsibility of the government. And it cannot be changed overnight. We have to go stage by stage, go to tier one cities, and now I can't say that I will develop only a few rural areas and other rural areas, I will not. No. Focus on all the rural areas and start with fundamental education. Go step by step. Identify the key priority areas. And most importantly, take teachers into confidence. If teachers can be trained well, nurtured well, appreciated well, empowered well, they can do wonders. Technology will automatically come and grow over a period of time. Thank you. All right. So for, <clears throat> for our next question, yeah. I would just like to call um, one, of our, one of our participants here at the Zoom uh, channel. So it's uh, I'd like to call Mr. Eric John Marmol of the OSD Philippine Science High School, Eastern Visayas uh, College. So um, you can let me ask you to address your question, sir. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my pressing question is actually on uh, how are we going to facilitate uh, to change the mindset of our key implementers for or the educators in order for them to embrace uh, the changes brought by the Education 4.0. Thank you. Okay. Uh... If I'm not wrong, you are going. Your, your question is, how do we change the mindset of the people who are going to embrace education 4.0, if I'm not wrong? So this question is about how do we change the mindset of the people, right? I believe he's asking about the key implementers, Dr. Avinash. Okay, uh, the mindset of the key implementers. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, huh. yes. See, uh, we all have to address this particular question. How the future is going to be? And how, the, how do we want future to be? Okay. So when there is an implementer or people who want to implement, they need to have a mindset. The question comes, why are we doing something? Is it just we are trying to do something because it is part of our job? Are, are we expecting to bring some change in the future where all our children and grandchildren are going to live in the future? 
And at the same time, if we do not do today, when are we going to do it? If not us, who else is going to do it? Do you think yourself to be an individual person or an independent family or do you think yourself to be a part of the society who wants to contribute to the societal growth? And want is the mother of invention. Now what kind of future we want? These people have to be brought in, taken into confidence, enhance their goals, enhance their thinking and ask them to do not just what they are doing today, and request them to do what is required for the future because they are all the major game changers. That is where they can create a history for the future. And the leadership plays a very important role here. You need a leader who can drive the education agenda. You need a leader who can drive the education institutions. And if they can inspire enough, rest of the people will drive the agenda. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. So um, for our next question, may I call uh, Ms. Janet Biloso from the Department of Education, uh, Regional Office 9. Uh, Ma'am, you may address your question. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, particularly you have mentioned about resources and infrastructures. That they are this are very crucial and uh, these are critical uh, 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 aspects in the success of education 4.0. So how is uh, the readiness particularly of Indian education or the sustainability of Indian education pertaining to these crucial aspects? Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for this uh, question. And uh, how ready is India for this? Okay. Uh, as I told you, India has huge population. There are 28 states and nine union territories. 60% of Indian population live in rural areas. There are more of private schools and public schools. There is a lot of disparity in the standard of living, accessibility, uh, what we call as the social status, the, the level the education is being delivered to. There is a lot of disparity. Now, when you look at the disparity, I see that embracing, embracing education 4.0 in a private school where fees are paid high, infrastructure is there, rich people go, it is not difficult at all. But the challenge is in the tier two, tier three cities and the rural areas. We do have the problem of infrastructure. We do have the problem of empowering our teachers. We do have the problem of internet and communication technologies. But the question is, how are we going to address is the question. That is where we have designed the new curriculum. And there is also digital India initiatives where we are trying to reach out to the rural population in a digital way, offering them the new digital equipments, offering them the new networks, uh, the network service providers company are going to the rural areas and philanthropists are coming and investing there and people are taking the responsibility towards becoming philanthropist. And why not? We as a citizen, I'm a professor, I go to my village, I should take care of education of some of the children over there. So it is a collective responsibility. Rural people are definitely deprived of information and communication technology. But we have to start somewhere. Start with empowering your teachers. Rest all the things are going to follow. Because 20 years back, you may had a phone where you used to have a phone and you were ringing. But today, everybody has a mobile. But in the next five years, technology will simply come. Google, Microsoft, they may bring in the best of technologies at the affordable cost. Internet may penetrate throughout the world free of cost. But by that day, are we ready with the way we have to deliver the actual education? Let us focus more on it. But yes, India as a country has a lot of challenges. Not only the government, the education institutions, the education bodies, the state governments, the union territory governments, the school heads, and the teacher responsibility to move forward in a single direction, whether we like it or not, because we want a very beautiful society for the future. Thank you. All right, so uh, may I call next uh, Marvin Daguplo, Mr. Marvin Daguplo of Southern Leyte State 
uh, University to address his question. Hello, good afternoon, sir. And thank you very much for, yes. And thank you very much for this very substantial input. Uh, I agree that uh, Education 4.0 now governs the global education. Uh, I should like, sir, to ask, what can you suggest in, to the Philippines on the strategies that we can do to change our curriculum in such a way that we are also producing teacher 4.0 that can respond to Education 4.0? Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, so what are the proposed uh, solutions or uh, what is our proposal or submissions to the government of the Philippines to uh, adopt to uh, Education 4.0? This is the question that I understand. Uh, uh, one thing we all have to understand is uh, without knowing what actually is existing and what is that we are expecting for the future, based on the regional disparities and the differentiation, uh, just giving a generic solution may not actually work out. So what the think tanks or the university heads and uh, education stalwarts, as well as the government at the national level, at the state level, or at the provincial level, what we all have to do is, instead of thinking something from the top and taking to that bottom level, we have to think at the bottom level what is expected. Now, what is the education policy that I was talking about? India was, it is not just that it has flown from top level to the bottom level. It is a policy which flows. But to formulate the policy, the understanding went from the bottom-up approach. So the school teacher has to be involved. The principals have to be involved. The department heads, the state heads, the prov you know, provincial head, the school teacher has to be department heads, the state head, country heads, the representatives, they all have to come together and then first take stack then decide what we are expecting and whatever gap that is there with the resources that we have, how do we bridge that particular gap? But thinking has to go inside. But if I generally have to tell you how we need to transform, the first thing I will say is whatever information communication technology is there, just keep it aside. Understand what is required for the future. Communicate to your school teachers. Take them into confidence. First, empower them. Create a passion in them. And they will slowly start bringing in changes. And based on which, you can start formulating the policies going forward. So without knowing what I have, I cannot decide what is to be done. So have two sides, what is existing and what is required. And whatever gap is there, we need to bridge. It requires investments, it requires training and development, it requires assessment methodologies, it requires innovative things, it requires things to incorporate new things, it requires to learn from other countries, and there is a brainstorming discussions which is actually required. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Avinash. So uh, perhaps I'll end uh, the open forum with this question from one of our YouTube uh, participants. From Ms. Maria Sheila Lagoda of uh, Department of Education in Naga. Change is inevitable. Uh, education must evolve fast. We are living witnesses of the change in education from Industry 1.0 to 4.0. Do you think we are fast approaching Industry 5.0 with the way we are teaching right now? Okay, okay. Good question. Thanks for this question. This is more strategic and I love such kind of critical questions to answer. So we have to learn very fast, okay? We don't have time to waste. Uh, time is moving very fast. Changes are happening very fast. So we need to learn fast. So whether adaptability will be so fast, that is going to be the question. See, if it was education 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, I was talking only about the teacher and the schools where they had to adopt. Today, everybody has to adopt. I still remember remember a school story where I learned the hare and the tortoise. You know, there was one line that I learned that slow and steady wins the race. Okay, that was a statement. They used to, people used to tell slow and steady wins the race. But today, the fast and consistent wins the race. Now, just because I want to run fast, 
if i forget being consistent and if i fail to do the fundamental things then it may lead to disaster so let us develop consistency and the speed also have to move in yes we don't have time to waste Five ten years will just go like that. We never know how the time flies. That is why we have to formulate goals, and the goals should be with timelines. India knows now what we need to achieve in next one year, next two years. That goal will go to the education department. It will go to the university level. It will go to the school level, and then they will again understand what is required at the school level to implement all these things. So this is a circular or a cycle thing. We all have to work together. You plan something. you do you take actions and you act on it plan do check act plan do check act that is how we need to follow the methodology yes we don't have time we have to be fast we have to be consistent because everybody has to take responsibility not just teacher not just student even parents have to take responsibility the government has to take responsibility the way organizations like apo and dap have taken the responsibility of delivering such kind of things to you thank you All right, thank you. So that ends our uh, open forum for this webinar. So it was a very informative and productive afternoon with you, uh, Dr. Avinash. And please do uh, read through the chat boxes in appreciation of, of your of your presentation. So as customary, before we end our webinar, I would like to invite everybody here at the Zoom uh, channel to please turn on their video for. Um, documentation purposes. We will have our class picture as we call it. And um, we also recognize our participants from the YouTube channel. And we do hope you have um, signed your, uh, your uh, attendance by typing in your name and agency at the chat box. All right, so um, all smiles now. So it's one, two. Okay. Take some more. It would be great if you could share your screen with us. We can see everyone. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, we'll just share your the pictures later, sir. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. and thank you all for being so wonderful and patiently listening for such a long discussions and if you have any questions you can write an email to me or whatsapp on the number i would be glad to be part of the growth story hey thank you for that sir so at the end of this session we would like to remind our participants to accomplish the feedback form through the link that will be flashed on the screen and typed at the chat box as well Uh, next week will be our last leg of this webinar series on leading education in the age of disruption. We will be joined by Dr. Francesco Pastore on Tuesday, September 22, 2020 at 2 p.m. to discuss on Education 4.0 in the Italian context. So we look forward to having you all again next week. Kindly await our advisory to this webinar session to your respective email addresses. Again, may remind you to accomplish the feedback form before you leave the after you leave the platform. Your feedback will be valuable in improving the delivery of this series and in our future interventions. We will be using this to further validate your attendance as well. It was a pleasure hosting you this afternoon. See you all next week. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay happy. Thank you, sir.